Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jeffrey Lyles. You are listening to Lyles Movie Files. Uh, over the weekend, on Saturday, AEW had their latest pay-per-view, Revolution 2020. And like they've been doing all along, AEW is kind of changing the game here. And this is a great show. Lots of fun. Clearly, at least one match of the year candidate. Some nice advancements and some story angles. And this was a show that, unlike a lot of big change pay-per-views, really has me looking forward to the next direction of the company. So let's break down the show. I'm going to spoil it right away and say I loved it. Uh, really looking forward to Wednesday night's Dynamite to see what happens. But let me break down all the different matches and my overall thoughts of the show. Okay, so first up, we get Jake Hagar versus Dustin Rhodes. Dustin is this guy who just refuses to realize he's been in the business since 89 and is still rolling at a high level. Hagar has basically been playing the bodyguard for Jericho and the rest of the inner circle while still having a little personality, which is different than the normal stiff bodyguard who doesn't utter or have any expression when he's hanging out with the rest of his crew. Uh, this was okay. This is probably my second least favorite match on the show. Uh, Jake does what he does, which is kind of that MMA brawler style. So it's kind of a, I don't say a styles clash, but it's not quite the showcase that they really could have gone with to make Jake look like this dominant force. I probably would have had him go against somebody smaller, maybe like a Joey Janela type, as opposed to a Dustin who's pretty much the same size physically and I don't want to say has a better move set, but his move set is good and gets fan, the fans engaged. It's a little slow, maybe not necessarily the one you want to have kick off the show. Uh, Jake was doing some, some fun heel tactics with his wife at ringside yelling and commentating throughout the match. And he'd go over every so often and kiss her. And then Dustin did the old school, let me kiss the valet of the heel and have her all all messed up and discombobulated. It was funny because when she got the kiss and all of Dustin's face paint was smeared all over her lips, she went, that's disgusting. It was great. Uh, the match was okay. Like I said, this is if if this was the match they wanted to use for Hagar's first AEW showcase, I probably wouldn't have opened up the show with it because it kind of set it up in this weird, okay, I can only get better from here. Not that it was bad, but it was just kind of there. Next up was probably the, sh the match they should have started off with, Darby Allen versus Sammy Guevara. And I tell my brother all the time that Sammy is basically playing the Buddy Roberts of the inner circle. I don't recall seeing him getting too many big wins or anything that really mattered outside of multi-man matches with Jericho and Pride and Powerful. But he is, I don't know, he's kind of got this ability to shake off all these losses. He's a punk. Everybody wants to see him get beat. He's got these flashy moves. So I think eventually he's going to be a really big and huge face in AEW. But for now, he's playing that kiss up to Jericho really well. Um, Darby, he's got this unique presence the fans dig him i just wish that jr would come up with something else for him other than the strange enigma it seems a little too close and on the nose to what he would call jeff hardy the charismatic enigma now this match started after about 10 minutes of crazy action and darby did something that i wish more people would do at the start of the match he didn't sit around and pose he didn't go up on the turnbuckles and and glare menacingly at, at sammy he just went right at him he dove outside the ring and started beating him down as if to imply he actually doesn't like this guy and that's weirdly something you don't see enough of in these grudge matches where the guys act like it's a normal thing he acted like he hated him um, I really feel like Darby could use like maybe 20 more pounds because he looks so small and I just don't necessarily buy all of his offense, but you know, he, he's got something and I just think with a little bit more weight, he could really shoot up to the top of this roster just because he'd look more physically imposing or whatever. I like that the commentary team didn't try to act like he, uh, Darby sold that Darby actually hit that move where he dove outside the Tope Suicida where he had Sammy draped on the on the barricade 
they actually were like, hey, he didn't get all that. Or I don't know if he got all that at all, which is great. This is exactly what you want your commentary team to do. If everybody can see it on the screen, don't act like it happened. Don't try to cover for him in a way that insults our intelligence. We saw he didn't hit it. They saw he didn't hit it. And they just said it. And it's okay. It's like, okay, his foot tripped. It's high risk. That's what happens sometimes. And that's really all you have to do. But that was a really good match. I think Darby has potential to be a real star. He's one of those guys that I think makes the case that AEW needs another title. Whether it's a U.S. title, TV title, whatever. It's just, that's something they need for those guys who aren't quite at the world's title level, but something for them to aspire to. So they can get on TV, defend a title, and also just shake up the dynamics. So if there's a heel champ, there's a face lower champ for he- for the other heels to go after. And vice versa, if there's a face champ. I think it makes sense. It's something AEW can do. They've been around for a year. It's okay now to introduce a secondary title. All right, so we've got... I don't think this was necessarily this point, but I just want to kind of talk about how cool... Uh, AEW's presentation is. These guys have been around for a year doing their pay-per-view specials and a little bit more with their one-off deals, but I have got to give it up to them. I mean, their their sets look great. They don't look like a company that's just starting out. Like I remember watching TNA when they started way way back in the day in like 2002. Their sets look really not cheap, but it was like kind of like how the NXT arena is where it was contained in a small space and it was fine for what they were presenting, but not quite the glitz and glam of the, of a WWE presentation. So I think it's really cool how great these sets look. And it's something that I'll talk about enough in my reviews about AEW, but when they go from different arena to arena, they actually mix up how it looks. And it's just, I don't know, that, that presentation means a lot. And watching them versus the NXT presentation, where it's the same arena every week, it's really cool watching how different AEW changes up their sets just from random arenas. Uh, When they're on the Jericho cruise ship, when they're in different spots, I mean, just they break up how they have their presentation each week. And I also really love their production with their videos and just their match layouts. Like, this is what's coming up next. Those graphics have a little bit of effort and work into them. And I love how they look. You know, that presentation is just, it adds so much more. It makes AEW look like a real legit promotion instead of one that's just getting started. And this is something, I mean, if you were to compare the two, you'd go, hey, NXT is the one that just is getting started while AEW has been the one that's been around for like five, seven years. And I love the shot with the commercial for Blood and Guts, which is basically AEW's answer to war games. I already started trying to figure out who the heck they're going to get for that match because I feel like the inner circle is the easy and obvious one. But I also feel like, man... If ever <laughs> there was at that time. And it's kind of weird because when the inner circle formed, it seemed like they were going to be the mirror, the evil mirror version of the elite. And so far, we really haven't had much of that conflict with the inner circle and the elite. And they've had a few skirmishes, but nothing is kind of even in the works right now that it would make sense for them to go to war games. I'm sure within the next 24 days they can build up something they're pretty good at that but it's not going to be something that's going to have developed for months and months like some of these other angles i'm sure they'll do a good job though so i'm looking forward to it but i figure this is definitely something they got to put the elite in right all right so next up was gonna spoil this one right away my favorite match on the show uh, Hangman Page and Kenny Omega defended their tag team titles against the Young Bucks. And the Young Bucks, I really like their matches when they are when they put a lot of thought and effort into it. And it's not just, bam, bam, let me hit the super kicks, let me do a couple flips, and I need Taker. I love when they have time to just kind of tell a story because I feel like that is something, I think that's, their best trait more so than their athleticism 
it's their ability to to get the audience along for the ride with their facial expressions just how Matt and Nick communicate with each other they're not just smiling and cocky they're all hey they actually have they're pretty good at the whole acting bit of wrestling in the course of a match like when Matt gets upset and Nick has to calm him down or he's selling a back injury I mean they they really up their game in terms of being performers beyond wrestling and Hangman Page has been, I got to say, the most improved performer over the last year. He's really gone on to this cowboy stuff bit and this drunken wild card. And it's cool actually not knowing where promotion is going to go with stuff. Because I came into this thinking, well, they could have Page turn on Omega and that's how they lose the titles or they could just have the young bucks go off and just attack them and and they just go heel and it just totally shakes up the whole elite dynamic or omega turns on page i mean there's so many different ways they could go with this and i was just really long for the ride and i feel like they largely avoided the super spam of their finishers omega didn't hit his one winged one winged angel because of the work Matt had done on his shoulder. I just loved like the intricacies, like the layers of this match where it built up, where it was Matt and Paige that were having all this beef and their emotions were boiling over. And then it started filtering over to Nick and Kenny too. And I was wondering if they were going to have at that point where uh, Paige put Nick through the table that, it was just all going to snap for Nick and they were going to go full heel and, and all this stuff. But this match was great. I, I grew up in the mid eighties watching wrestling. So I was just sucked all into tag team wrestling, midnight express, rock and roll express, British bulldogs, hard foundation, doom Steiners, etc. I mean, these are the matches that I really got into maybe even to agree more so than single matches and this this thing just really played off well. And at the end, the Bucks took the loss, which I think is the right call. You know, they're they're bulletproof Teflon, whatever you want to call it. They will they could lose eight straight matches and still just just be as over with the fans and everybody, and it would not matter whatsoever. But to really build up this division, it's important for them to build up other tag teams. And they did a great job with SCU. They did it here with with Paige and Omega. And I don't know, it's, it's really cool watching Paige develop as a superstar. When he was in ROH, I thought, this guy has a lot of potential to be great. And when they were kind of like, well, who is Matt Taven going to put in his new kingdom? I thought that was going to be a good role for Paige to get up to that next level. And instead, he went into Bullet Club, and you know how that worked out for him. But I think going to AEW, being a vital part of the elite, has taken him to a whole new level. And I remember when their very first pay-per-view came, with when they were deciding the champ between Jericho and Paige, that I really would have gone with Paige because I just kind of tired of Jericho's thing. But it seems like career-wise, losing that match was the best possible thing for Paige because he's gone on to be, I don't want to say bigger than the belt, but if he had if he had won the belt, I don't think he'd be at the same height that he is right now. And Omega kind of felt like he was floundering in the promotion, which was weird because it's like Omega is one of or the best wrestler in the world. Why is he being presented on this lower level? I think now they kind of realize we need to tweak that a little, showcase him as one of the top stars in our promotion. And these two together make for a really, really interesting dynamic. At the end of the match, the Bucks and and Omega were kind of together, and they kind of gave this look at Paige, and he looked kind of like, what's happening? What's going on? I felt like, yeah, I could see all of them doing a triple super kick here. And then Omega was in the ring 
And Paige was on the outside. He kind of looked like he was going to tease a buckshot lariat. And what I really loved about that was Tony and Excalibur caught it too and said something about it. I feel like too often the announcers miss those very, very subtle things. But Tony and Excalibur were on it. And it led all this kind of, oh shoot, where are they going to go with this? And I just love wrestling, great wrestling matches with great stories. And this is the best story going on right now. And I am loving it. I don't know where they're going to go. I don't know what the end game is, but I am really all on board for this ride. And and if you're only able to see one match in this show, this is definitely one to catch. So far, the best match I've seen in 2020. It's March, so there's probably time for some better matches to come up. But I also kind of feel like this can last and at least be in the top five all the way until the end of the year. Next up, we get the women's championship match. Nyla Rose versus Chris Statlander. And the commentators mentioned that Statlander had been dealing with the flu. So I was kind of thinking, all right, well, this should be a five-minute match. She's got the excuse. She's a little groggy. Maybe do a deal where she's selling like she's woozy and not quite up to speed. Instead, we got a 12-minute and 55-minute match. I don't think that did either one of them any favors. I don't... I'm not the biggest Nyla fan. I think she's a little sloppy in terms of her transitions. In terms of, like, chaining a move together. It's a lot of impact move. Walk around. Try to figure out what she's doing. If she's, like, this threatening, menacing beast like Vader who just snorted the whole time. It was just mean and nasty. Or if she's going to be more of an entertaining big woman who kind of dances around and, and, I don't know, has more personality. It's like when Statlander missed her dive outside, she kind of did this two-step and then was like, haha, I'm smarter than you. I don't know if that's the best presentation for her. And I still feel like she's working her way through figuring out how to pull off all the moves she's got in her head it's like oh, i want to do this and the execution is you can tell there's still a little thinking process from move to from thought to move and it makes their matches a little slow and i'm always of the mindset that you want your best wrestler or your best talker to have the title in a, in the best case scenario your best wrestler and your best talker are the same guy. And I think with this women's division, which is still very much a work in progress, Nyla is probably not the best face for that. Just because of this new switch on her personality with her going super heel, I'm not sure if Britt Baker wouldn't be a better choice for that champion because she can at least get people riled up to hate her and boo her. Whereas Nyla, I don't think, really gets much emotion from anybody. And then pitting her against somebody like Chris Statlander, who's not quite the same size, but certainly not going to get much sympathy in terms of, oh man, she's beating up this poor defenseless woman, like Rio. I, I don't know. This this match was there. It went way too long. I think if it was five minutes, it would have been way more effective. Nyla could have been showcased more as a beast. And Statlander could have had the excuse, I had a flu, I want a rematch. I don't know. This this women's division in AEW needs some work. I'm still not sure who the showcase centerpiece of that division is. And I don't know. I feel like Britt Baker now is that face of the division. You know, when she first started, it was like, yes, this is her division. And then she kind of floundered. Now she's found her personality as a heel. It just seems more like that's where they ought to go. But I actually think a Swole versus Nyla Rose match could be pretty good too. And I think this is why we need more promo time for the women in this division. Because they're just there. They just come in, have these matches, and they leave. I still don't understand what Statlander's gimmick is. I love when Tony called out Excalibur like, what What are you saying? She's an alien? She's not used to Earth's atmosphere? I mean, it's great. Excalibur is kind of still into the characters of these guys, so he tries to sell them in a way that they're book-like gimmicks, where Tony and JR kind of get this, what are you talking about? That's stupid. What are you saying? That's not real life. And it's this interesting dynamic because 
Excalibur is so committed, and there's still like these guys who've been doing wrestling forever, and like, come on, dude, let's give it a program. It's funny. Next up was the big grudge match. Cody versus MJF. Now, right away, this match was weird to me because as he's coming to ringside, I am noticing something on Cody's neck. And I cannot turn away from it because I'm like, what is this thing on his neck? Cody apparently got a ghastly neck tattoo. <laughs> and that is not a temporary tattoo, but a real one with his American Nightmare brand. On Instagram, he was explaining that, you know, he's going to have more tattoos. He wanted to have his own brand on his body, which is fine. I mean, hey, man, it's, it's certainly not like he's going to be the first guy in wrestling with a tattoo. It's just weird that he decided to put it on his neck. Cause it's like that just it's distracting. And I think from a TV perspective, when you're not zoomed in close, it looks more like a cut, like a scrape, a bruise. So it just keeps, it kept grabbing my attention. Like what's happened to his neck? Oh, that's right. That's just that gaudy tattoo he's got on there. And it seems more like a back tattoo, maybe a, you know, rib area tattoo. It's just, it's not like Cody's, it's not like Cody's Randy Orton where he's like, Hey, where do I have room for a new tattoo? He's not Batista where basically every inch of his chest is covered so I just felt like, hey, dude, you've got one tattoo dream written on your left pec, and you've got all this other space. Why the neck? It just seemed weird. And it was, I don't know, it kind of felt like this was a lack of good judgment, Cody. And this is the same lack of good judgment that made you think that MJF was your friend and buddy. And if this is what this guy's thinking, then I'm not sure if I can support him. Which is weird because I'm like, hey, I'm I'm supposed to be into this, but that stupid tattoo just really bothered me uh so we got what i what fair was basically the match we were going to get with this cody and arn came out with him and so did Stephen amell and dustin and a bunch of other guys who i did not recognize and cody was hyped up and ready mjf really really riles up the fans he knocks off hats throws beers in people's faces I don't know if these guys are plants, but he really does a good job of acting like a despicable heel that cannot get any cheers from the fans. And I think he works really hard on that. Uh, Cody had messed up his foot in that cage match against Wardlow, so that became like a element of the match as it progressed where MJF was stepping on the boot and taking the boot off and actually biting his foot. I mean, like I said, this guy goes nuts trying to stay the super heel. Brandy splashed a drink in Warlow's face and later she took a dive at him and then Cody had to save her. A uh, bunch of low blows from both sides and then Cody finally got it and he hit crossroads twice. He wanted a third one. MJF did the big knee and then he got the diamond or dynamite ring and knocked out Cody to get the win. And this is 24 minutes and 30 seconds. I felt like, okay, this was presumably match one in their rivalry this long feud that they're going to have and i just felt like this maybe was too much for the first one i know cody likes to have like those half hour esque matches but i feel like this was one where he loses control of his emotions mjf gets a he gets beat down bloodied up and then he cheats to win and that's what happened but i feel like that same thing could have been accomplished in half the time. Like if this is a tighter 12 minutes. This is a good match. I feel like there's too much distraction, too much delaying, and not enough intensity spread out through 24 minutes. In 12 minutes, I think we get all the hatred and loathing that we want to get. And like MJF did a good job with his with his deal, but I I don't know. You know, you watch Jericho. And he's late 40s, early 50s. And I feel like he does everything he can to get the most out of his matches. 
MJF feels like a classic 1980s heel um, with a little bit of 2020 attitude, trolling attitude. But I don't know if, I don't know, maybe it's his moveset or something. Something's just missing from his, at, when he gets into the ring. Like when I when he's talking, I want to see him get beat up. But when he starts wrestling and he's on the offense, it's just kind of there. And I don't know if that's part of what makes his charm because he's not a flashy heel. But I don't know. There's something that I kind of want more out of from his matches. And I haven't seen that great MJF match yet. Uh, next up was Pac versus Orange Cassidy. I have somehow gotten all into the Orange Cassidy hype. I love how Tony and JR talk about him like, they, like they're finally in on the joke. It's hilarious to me. And I think the re- one of the reasons why I'm a fan of Orange Cassidy is because he reminds me of my 49ers head coach, Kyle Shanahan, um, just with sunglasses and a shirt with his face on it. So Cassidy was doing his thing, and the fans were were really going silly, crazy, going with a chance, and overselling all of his sloth-like moves, like the ring introduction where he was from wherever, Wayne and whatever. But Justin Roberts did a really great job on this entire show. I think he's an underrated aspect of the AEW presentation, and he's just fun. And you can tell that he's like, yeah, I'm not in the WWE anymore. I could actually have fun doing ring announcing. This match was way more fun than I thought it was going to be. Cassidy has this thing where he was able to keep his eh, lethargic moveset going, but then eventually started waking up and getting into it. And Pac was getting more desperate. And then uh, they were just doing some really cool moves while still keeping into Cassidy's character, which I think is super impressive because it felt like he was in, he was locked in with what his character is, what he should be doing in this role, and Pac was a good guy to play off with. And this was was really fun. The only thing I didn't like about it was the finish, where the Lucha Brothers came out and they attacked the the best friends, and then Pac gets his brutalizer for the win. And I just didn't like it in the sense that the Lucha Brothers haven't had enough beef with the best friends that they would come out in this situation. I don't know, maybe these are three more guys you see in this war games if it's not going to be Elite versus Inner Circle. At least they're, at least we've laid the groundwork for it. Um, but yeah, I, I want to see I want to see more Orange Cassidy matches. This is his first match in AEW that we'd seen on any real showcase and I want more. I think he's super entertaining and he's exactly the kind of guy that makes AEW different than everything else out there. So more freshly squeezed, please. Last up was Le Champion, Chris Jericho defending his title versus John Moxley. Moxley came out like a super G. He was outside of the arena, he walked in, it was cold. You see him and he's doing his thing. He's walking through the crowd. Moxley looks like a star, like a super, super, superstar. And he just, I don't know, he, he's that guy the moment where it's, where it's clear that he's the centerpiece so, showcase of the promotion. And, you know, as he's walking in, as Jericho's walking in, Jericho's got a choir singing his theme song, and he's got Ortiz and Santana coming out to ringside with him. I'm just thinking... They've got to put the belts off of Jericho because Jericho is bulletproof. He doesn't need the belt. And he is absolutely another guy that they should come up for with a secondary title for. So he can have something, still be the champion, and have his belt where he's going against uh, Luciosaurus, um, Jack Perry, uh, even Marco Stunt, Scorpio Sky, those kind of guys, Tremperetta. Chucky e. T fighting those guys and and then that way he can still do his thing as a loudmouth arrogant champion without being without having to be the best wrestler in the promotion because I feel like there's probably like eight guys who are better than Jericho in the ring and I feel like everything before the ring <laughs> before the actual match is a great part of AEW but the in-ring action is still where it's really at for them. And I think on a short list of better wrestlers than him in the promotion, Pac, Omega, 
Page now at this point. Moxley, Phoenix, Pentagon, uh, that's six. Yeah, I mean, so maybe it's just six, but that's still a little bit too many for me, for my champ to not necessarily be the best in that crew. It's not the best. It's not the best. It's not the best, as Ortiz would say. All right, so it's time for the match. And they do the, the full-out hatred, can't stand each other, that I wanted from other matches. They're into it. They're brawling, going nuts. And they finally get back into the ring, and Jericho's taking over. And I think Jericho, I always think of when I'm watching Jericho's AW matches, if Jericho had a time machine and could go to 2008, and come to AEW, he would be the best wrestler in the world because he could take his, you know, his current, just rile everybody up with Jericho in his prime where he knew what he was doing, didn't have to waste moves, but he could pull it out if needed. I feel like that was the best of Jericho. And, you know, he was a great storyteller in the ring too. He's still a great storyteller, but he's not able to do everything he wants to tell. So I think he's he's done a really good job of overcoming his physical limitations. And I think he looked in better shape than he has the last few matches. But, yeah, I just, it's like, ah, oh, come on, man. He's not as good as Moxley in this situation. And I think Mox should get the belt here. So uh, Jericho's cheating. Moxley gets busted open around his uh, patched up right eye and mash keeps playing out it's going good inner circle starts interfering aubrey tosses them to the back while she's dealing with them sammy comes out and clocks moxley with the title and it looks like he really really clocked him with the title because there's a huge gash in moxley's head and it seemed like Aubrey and Moxley were both trying to take pieces from the title out of Moxley's head and fingers. So if you're watching it again, look for it. Because it really seemed like they were <laughs> like, oh, shoot, this stuff is actually in your skin. Uh, so it kept going for a little bit longer. Jericho started messing with Moxley's good eye. And then Moxley countered the Judas effect, did his Death Rider, and then all of a sudden he does the super ha ha gashi, pulls off the eye patch that he actually could see. So this was this was really cool because Moxley has been working that eye patch for so many weeks now, where he's been protecting it and making a big deal like I've got to keep my eyes safe and pulling it down in the middle of his matches. So to pull it off now and be like ha, I got you was a great moment and it was like okay he's got to win now because this is his ultimate trump card he's got to pull it off he does he hits the uh gosh the it's not his dirty deeds but whatever they call it now and he got the one two three we have a new champion it was very exciting and i think this is absolutely the right result as a result i really like this match I thought that was the right way to do business. I mean, Jericho was, he was the showcase dude for this promotion exactly for as long as he needed to be. Now it's time to see what happens with Moxley as the star of this promotion, as the champion. And I think that he is going to do exceptional in this role. Uh, he did a post-match pre promo. He was just shooting off the cuff. His music started up, and he was like, yo, what the... It was it was perfect. It's so John Moxley. I cannot wait to see who they throw against him. I almost don't want them to do the immediate rematch. I feel like that's always the thing in wrestling. Oh, the champ loses, then he gets the first rematch, and that's the headline on the next pay-per-view. I actually want to see somebody new come up, and then Jericho get a rematch, say, September or October. So Moxley's had time to enjoy his title reign for a bit. Um, so yeah, that 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 was really fun. Really liked the end result. Looking forward to seeing what they do on Wednesday. And yeah, so that was that was AEW Revolution 2020. If you haven't seen it, I think you should. It's well worth checking out. The tag match is, I think, going to stand the test of time. Be one of the best tag matches we've seen in the last few years. 
I think of all the AEW matches I've seen, this is that was my favorite because of the story and the match. I know a lot of people raved about Cody versus Dustin last year, and I felt that this one had that story of the first of Cody and Dustin with better action. So definitely worth checking out. And for the moment and what it means for the promotion, you definitely should see uh, Moxley versus Jericho. And I feel like that that's what you need to see. Those are the two. If you can only see, if you can't watch the whole show, that's what you need to check out. Um, the show is three hours and 30 minutes, maybe a little too long. You know, I've mentioned the two matches. They could have shaved off in half and had a tighter show. But overall, this is definitely not the eight-hour WWE presentation as we get into WrestleMania season. So very good. A really good show. I'm loving what AEW is doing. Hopefully next month I'll, or later this month, I'll be back to talk about Blood and Guts War Games. But yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to what they're going to do the next few weeks and the next few shows. So AEW, keep up the great work, and I will talk to you all later. This episode of Lyle's Movie Files has been filed.